בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, we're back here in uh, Sunny Isles, uh, doing our Sunday questions and answers שיעור, so you guys have asked about five questions before the שיעור, I'm hoping you can ask at least another five questions after the שיעור, now that it started, so other people could be זוכה to, uh, to hear your questions and to learn from them בעזרת השם. Uh, the שיעור uh, will be uh, also for עילוי um, נשמת דוד בן מסעודה, ידידנו היקר, מורנו רבנו, הרב יוסף מזרחי, זה מזכה הרבים הגדול. His father, בעזרת השם, is in the shema, will go higher and higher in heaven, בעזרת השם. Also for רפואה שלמה for my father, בעזרת השם, דוד בן עשריה, רפואה שלמה, רפואת הנפש, רפואת הגוף. הקדוש ברוך הוא will give him a lot of הצלחה, פרנסה טובה, בעזרת השם. And uh, the ability to overcome this uh, major obstacle, Baruch Hashem, that he's been given. Anyone that's given a big obstacle, you should say, Hashem. Hashem. Why? Because if you're given a big obstacle, that means you could overcome it. That means you could overcome it. You don't uh, say it to them, you say it to yourself. Because you say it to them, it's not, it's, not so, uh, it's not so easy for them to accept it, unless you are someone they know that is a Da'at Torah walking. Um, but uh, aside from that, also Refua Shlema for uh, Levana Bat Sara, uh, for uh, Doris Bat Jora, um, uh, Dvora Bat Mercedes, Elisheva uh, Chaya Bat Sara, Yuda Ben Dvora, Yochevet Bat Batya, and all of Am Yisrael Bezot Hashem will have Refua Shlema, Refua Ta Nefesh, Refua Ta Guf. Uh, this uh, shiur will be uh, a big help for, for us Hashem, to do tshuva and uh, Hashem, through our tshuva and our mitzvot we will uh, help all of these special neshamot overcome obstacles, get higher and higher in Gan Eden and uh, Hashem, get closer and closer to Hashem Yitbarach Now, uh, the, qu- the shiur is a question I have, Baruch Hashem, lots of interesting material but uh, shiur is a questions and answers and you guys, it seems like you have today, Baruch Hashem, you came with fire you have Gemara question from uh, Rabbi Asher. You have uh, some uh, Kabbalah questions from Amos. You have uh, some uh, some other uh, Gemara questions from uh, uh, from the back. You have uh, Baruch Hashem Yaakov, Baruch Hashem. So Baruch Hashem, you guys have some questions finally. So why don't you uh, start? Give me a couple of questions, and uh, we'll see where Bezot Hashem Hashem takes us. Ken. Similar concept, similar concept. Uh, it's, it's good to, it's good to be mezayel. The, the question is, when you're eating something that has waste, eating something that has waste, whether it be pistachios or olives or anything else on Shabbat, you have to be uh, very careful with in regards to burer. The burer is separating the good from the bad. So you have to, uh, for the sake of being careful with, uh, so you don't uh, make any su Torah, su deoraita, uh, it's uh, very uh, smart to uh, if you're gonna have if you're gonna put it just on your plate, if you put it just on your plate, uh, that's one thing because you have good on your plate, you have good on your plate. But if you're putting it into let's say some cup or some bucket, uh, let's say the seed or the peel, you're putting something else, then you have to put uh, at least one or two good ones in the same place that you're throwing out the waste. Uh, so there's no Iborer. Why? Because now you're, you're not taking the good from the bad. You take, there's good, and then you're putting the bad in a place that also has good. So there's good in both places. But I can tell you also, for, for, the, for this, since obviously Hashem, we try to learn Musa, we try to learn Midot, it's uh, also you have to be very careful to not to be disgusting. Uh, I know this may sound funny to some people, but this is a Isu Deoraita. Uh, you're not allowed to be disgusting. So the Gemara says, I believe it's actually Masechet Shabbat, you may have gone over it. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the Tanaim, at the time, they were able to tell the difference between a, uh, a Arbe, which is what we call a uh, grasshopper today. Uh, they were able to tell the difference between the kosher one and non-kosher ones. The Temanim, the Yemenites today, that still live in Yemen, can still tell. Because it's a minag for them for 3,000 years. They haven't, uh, they haven't left home, Baruch Hashem, Hashem, that they're still there. Should never, the, the head rabbi of Yemen, by the way, recently said, no one should leave. No more. Because anyone that left, Hashem and Hashem, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems. Anyway, anyone that left, uh, time to do tshuva. But uh, even if you think you did tshuva. 
but uh, the, uh, even in Iran, Iran, there's some Yehudim there, there's some Jews in Iran. The rabbi over there said, no one should leave. Stay in Iran. If you're a religious, religious Jew in Iran, stay there. Yeah, but the Iranians are killing people. Yeah, but they're not killing religious Jews. They're killing Zionists. So anyway, the, uh, the Minag of, of uh, Yemen still alive for people that live there because they are able to tell the difference between a Arbe, between a grasshopper, or what we call a grasshopper, uh, that's kosher and non-kosher. Now, if you see a grasshopper and you eat it, that's a Yisur Torah, genom for at least a few years. Unless you do tshuva. Why? Because it's uh, making sins, making sins against Torah. It's at least five pigs. It's like you ate pig five times. Anytime you eat a bug, it's uh, that you're able to see with your eyes, it's five different sins in the Torah. Now, if you can't see it with your own eyes, meaning it's one of these microscopic uh, bugs, then uh, the, it's, it's not a sin from the Torah, but it still makes you spiritually stupid. It still hurts you, but uh, there's no gain on for it. But if somebody eats a bug on purpose because he wants to go to a local non-kosher place and just eat salad, because he thinks he's beating the system by going to a non-kosher place and eating salad that still has you know, the meat of the, of, the, of the bugs in it, he should actually, uh, no, he's, he's eating meat, he can't eat milk. But anyway, that was a joke. That's what the left there. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the thing is, though, is that uh, the uh, people that were able to tell the difference between a kosher albe and non-kosher would eat them. Why would they eat them? Why is it so delicious? I don't know how it tasted, but the Gemara says that there was a special ma'ala, there was a special significance in these specific type, not all of them, in these specific type of arbe, that if you ate the arbe, you ate the grasshopper from the right side, you ate it from the right side, then it would open up your mind that you were able to consume as much Torah as you wanted in a moment. You'd be able to study the entire Shas in five minutes. But then you have to eat the second half, it's left half. Why? So it's concealed and you don't forget it. Why? If you don't eat the other half, you forget everything. Forget everything. So one of the Tanaim did it. He ate one. The other Tana says, it's not kasher. No, kasher. No, it's kasher. He goes, no, it's not kasher. He goes, why not kasher? He says, it's disgusting. It's disgusting me. It's just not that it's the bug itself that technically is not a bug, so therefore you're allowed to eat it. It's not kasher. No, it's kasher. But you're eating next to me, and it's disgusting me that there's little legs crawling out of your mouth. It's disgusting me. It's not kasher. Meaning, Rabotai, that to be disgusting makes you not kasher. Not the bug. The bug is kasher. You're not kasher. So you're not allowed to be disgusting. What does it have to do with the olives and all of the other foods that have peels in them? A lot of fruits have peels in them and olives have, you know, the pits in them and different things. And people have this uh, bad teva, bad, bad midot that they don't know, they don't realize it's bad. But they, they spit out the pit out of their mouth and they put it on the table. There's nothing other than other things that come out of the body. Shemirachem, excuse me for, for being frank, but that's just, you have to say this. Other than that, there's nothing more disgusting. Nothing that comes out of your body other than Torah is good looking. Everything else is disgusting. Which reminds us another reason not to ever be arrogant, because everything is disgusting that comes out of us other than Torah, and Torah is not ours anyway. But the point is, Rabotai, is that you're not allowed to be disgusting. So if you're sitting in a table and you're eating these seeds, like people like Israelis uh, typically like to eat seeds, and they put all the klipot, all of the peels on the table, they build themselves Mount Sinai, Everest, uh, the, the mountains, or, you know, they, everybody compares their mountains. There's nothing more disgusting than this. For anybody else that's not eating it, or is normal, that sees the, the peels that come out of your mouth with all the gone nefesh that you have in your mouth and the saliva is dripping from it, there's nothing more disgusting than that. That makes even the, uh, the seeds, sunflower seeds, look, look kosher. It's not kosher. Not kosher. Why? It's disgusting. You're not allowed to be disgusting. So it's very, very important that if you're going to eat olives, which I like very much, and I'm sure you do as well, try, my suggestion is eat the ones that don't have pits in them. That's the best way. Well, it saves you the headache, plus maybe a tooth. So you don't... 
But if you have to have, because I don't know, the ones that you like come in that uh, only come with pits in them, then what I would suggest you do is have a napkin handy. Have a napkin handy, and every time you take the olive, you want to take it out of your mouth, the pit out of your mouth, take it out with the napkin. Therefore, the people that are sitting next to you don't see anything other than the napkin, and you leave it in the napkin. No one has to see the guanifish that goes out in your mouth. It's not nice. It's not nice for somebody else who's trying to eat his, uh, his Shabbat meal, and he sees stuff that comes out of your mouth. It's not nice. Or sometimes people don't like the food. You know, some, some people, they don't like the food. So they want to make sure you know they don't like the food. So what do they do? They start spitting it on the table. They start taking it out of their mouth and put it on their, on their plate. Oh, sir, this is not good. What? Well, not good. It's not good. Now I'm not hungry anymore. I want to vomit. It's not nice. So you're not allowed to be disgusting. Why? Because that turns the purest cow that you just paid $100 for a steak on, look at shell. It's not kosher anymore. Why? Because you're not kosher. The cow's good. The cow goes to Gan Eden. You, on the other hand, something else. Why? Not allowed to be disgusting. It's bad midot, and it causes other people anguish. So we learn this from the Gemara. We learn this from this Gemara that we're not allowed to be disgusting. Next. Okay. So a Talmit Chacham is obligated to represent Hashem. All of us are obligated to, to represent Hashem, but a Talmit Chacham is supposed to know that he is a representative of Hashem at all times. Meaning that any time, any regular person, any Amaretz, any regular Balabite thinks of Torah, he has to visualize something. He has to visualize something. He has to visualize something alive. He's not going to visualize this Farim HaKadoshim behind me. He's not going to visualize that. Why? Because to him it's just a, some cow, miskenada cow, they skinned her, then they made her skin into a paper, and we read it and somebody picks it up and pays a few thousand dollars for it. He doesn't really know what it means, what to be a Sefer Torah. So what does he see? He sees the living Sefer Torah. He sees the Talmud Chacham, he's a Sefer Torah. So now if he sees the Sefer Torah, looks like he's homeless. To such an extent that not because uh, he doesn't have enough more clothes. If he doesn't have any more clothes, it's a different story. But if he sees him, he always looks like a bum. He always smells terrible. He has stains on his shirt. He says, oh, ze Torah ve schara. This is the Torah and this is the reward for it. So if I go learn to- if I don't learn Torah, I'm a shirke kolach. I have houses in every city. I have cars. I have this. This Tamil Chacham is... Look at this. He still has his chulent on, on, his, on his shirt. Disgusting. He always smells bad too. And he starts giving the Torah a bad name. He's a Chilul Hashem. So the Chilul Hashem that he causes, that's, uh, that's why Chav Mita. Now, they ask the next question, which is what happens if it, if it happens in Shabbat? It happens in Shabbat, and he doesn't have another shirt. He doesn't have another shirt. Does he go to Beit Knesset or no? Answer is, goes to Beit Knesset. Why? Because then it's a Kiddush Hashem. Why is it Kiddush Hashem? He goes to the Knesset with the stain on. Why? Because anyone that has any dot, any mind, knows he's not allowed to launder on Shabbat. So, wow, look, this Talmud Chacham came with a stain on Shabbat. He keeps Shabbat. He's a, he's a, serious, he's a serious Shabbat observer. Why? Because it's, it's Busha to go walk around with a stain. It's Busha. It's not, it's not nice. But he's walking around with a stain. Why? Because it's even more important to go pray to Hashem with a minyan. So that's Kiddush Hashem. But a regular week, when he's able to change his shirt and he chooses not to, it's Chilu Hashem. Chilu Hashem, Chayav Mita. Next question. Yes. Why would anybody make a nether? Miskin. Okay. Oh, somebody made a nether. Okay. Um, as far as nedarim vows uh, that people make in general if anyone that makes a nedar in general should probably go to a psychiatric hospital um, because there's absolutely no reason to make a nedar unless you're in such a ma'ala of tzadikut that you're going to say I'm making a nedar that I'm not going to sleep tonight. I'm going to finish the entire daf or five dapim or sh- whatever it is that you're going to finish. Meaning, you're doing for something that's above and beyond the law and to push yourself because you're so scared of Hashem, 
You're scared of Hashem to, to go against the Nedim. Scared, scared of Hashem? I'm going to force myself. Why? Because anytime I, one eye is going to close, the other eye is going to start hitting it. Why? Hey, you just made a Nedim. That's when you make a Nedim. To, most people, they make Nedarim, they're fools. They're fools. Why? Because number one, they make Nedarim for things they're obligated to do anyway. Most people make Nedarim. Oh, I make a Nedar, I'm going to keep Shabbat. That neder is pasul. It's, it's a waste of time. You actually made a sin. You made a sin for wasting the words that come out of your mouth. Balta shchit of the words that come out of your mouth. Why? You're obligated to do it anyway. You're obligated to keep Shabbat. You can't say, I make a neder to uh, put on tzitzit. What, what neder? It says in, uh, says in every day, Shema Yisrael, you say, you say it twice a day. You have to put tzitzit on. I make a neder, I'm going to be nice to my wife. What do you mean, uh, nice to your wife? <laughs> You have to love her as much as you love yourself and mechabeda, uh, you give her kavod, more than yourself. What nether is this? Most people make nedarim, they make nedarim vows for things they're obligated to do. So most people's nedarim are complete nonsense. That's one. Second class of people that make nedarim for things that they can't really do, and they put themselves in a, in a very, very bad spiritual state. And the reason why is because when a person breaks a nedar, He's putting not just himself, he's putting his entire family in danger of death. No less, no more, no less. Death. Shem says, you break a neder, death penalty is going to happen in that house. Why would such a person put other people's lives for his craziness? Why would he put other people's lives in danger? For what? What, what are we, Moshe Rabbeinu all of a sudden? If you're Moshe Rabbeinu, you don't need a neder. Now, let's say, assume the guy or the woman is a mama, tzadeket, kedusha, amazing, if they exist still in this generation, bichlal. let's say they exist and they made a neder, and uh, unfortunately they weren't able to achieve it. They go to Atarat Nedarim, as long as it's a kosher forum, the, there's, uh, the rabbis, they do the whole uh, Atarat Nedarim, uh, they're, uh, they're absolved of this neder. If it's a wife and a husband can cancel it the same day, but in general, uh, if that didn't happen, they go to on Yom Kippur or during Yamim Noraim before it, and they can get it. Uh, they can get it. Uh, I guess uh, to be uh, to be no no longer a neder. It's still not a good status to be in, uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, it's cancelled. Uh, and any thoughts they have about it uh, afterwards is simply because they still haven't done tshuva for the original foolishness that they had. It's not a new neder. They don't make a new, you can't make a neder psychologically, or you can't make a new neder through your mind. You only make a neder through words. You have to actually state it. You have to state that you're making a neder to do such and such. But anyone, word to the wise, anyone that knows uh, the consequence of breaking a neder is simply never going to make one. Never going to make one. I remember Arab Nisim, again, Arab Shalom used to say that people that make nederim should just go to uh, Barbanel which is a mental institution. Why? Because you're putting your life, other people's lives in danger for what? What, what exactly are you trying to achieve here? Who are you, what are you trying to prove? There's no reason to do it. There's just no reason to do it, and people that are doing it usually can't fulfill it anyway. So, and again, if a person is in such a ma'ala, such a high level, that they're making the darin to push themselves harder, then that's a different story. But between you and I, for the most part, in... Uh, there's not many of those. There's not that many of those. That's not who we're really catering to in our shiurim. Those people are not watching them anyway because they don't have internet. Next question. Same price. That's a funny story. Yeah, it's a funny story. Ken, that's a funny story, but in Shemaim you still be considered... 100%. 100%. It's a funny story, but it's a, yeah, it's, not, uh, it's a funny story that could possibly be real. Some uh, uh, some people say it's real. Some people say it's not. Uh, it's, we like to say it's not because we'd like to think that all of Am Yisrael are not Rashaim, They're just clueless, but not Rashaim because somebody that does such a thing is a Rasha. But there's a story that uh, I think I've told you guys a long time ago that there was a, a certain Rav of Akeila that uh, wanted to raise money for mikveh. And uh, unfortunately, his keila had uh, a lot of rich people that liked their money more than they liked God. The Gemara says that there's certain types of people, they like their money more than their goof, more than their own body, more than their own life. And we see it more and more today. 
unless you publicize people's donations, they're only going to give you what's in their pocket, not necessarily what's in their bank. In their pocket, if singles, 20s, maybe a $100 bill, if you publicize it, then we go to the checkbook. Then we go to the bank. But anyway, the problem is that today, people want a lot of kavod. They like their money too much. And uh, it's a sad situation. It's, nothing has really changed in that aspect. But in this rough keila, he had a lot of rich people in this keila. And you need to build a mikveh. Without a mikveh, there's no keila. You can't have a uh, Jewish uh, community without a mikveh. You can't. Why? Because uh, that means that nobody's allowed to be with their wife. A woman doesn't go to a mikveh. She's not allowed to even touch the finger of a, uh, of a husband. As a side note, there was a story of a uh, certain person, certain Yehudi, that, uh, that um, came, to, uh, came to the U.S. And uh, no one really knew him. No one really spoke to him. Just uh, another Jew, older guy, Russian guy. And uh, after uh, he died, the wife came to the kila. He's like, please, we need a minyan. We need something. Please help us. Kavod for, for the tzaddik. No one knew this guy. No one knew who he was. He never said a single word. It's like, what tzaddik? Well, why is he tzaddik? Like, okay, well, you know. At his, the Rav went with the wife. And at his kevil, the Rav didn't know anything about him. So the wife spoke. It's not usually Minak for the, but the wife spoke. I like to say a story about my husband. My husband was a tzaddik. Not because I say. Because my husband was a tzaddik. Why? In Russia, the Efsektia Imachimam Bezikram, they made sure to destroy anything related to Judaism. You weren't allowed to learn Torah, you weren't allowed to practice Torah. One of the ways they wanted to do it is destroying anything resembling a mikveh. So from the minute we got married, and for over 50 years, my husband never touched my finger. We lived in the same house. He never touched my finger. Why? Because I couldn't go to mikveh. The rabbi started crying hysterical, came to his keila and started crying in front of them. He says, we all have to do tshuva. We just had the biggest tzaddik in the world in our keila for years. And no one knew anything. What tzaddik? What tzaddik? He told him the story. Who among us can be next to anything, next to his wife, for 50 years without touching our finger? Who can do such a thing? Alvay in his generation, we have such people. But the reality is, Rabotai, is that a keila without a mikveh is not a keila at all. There's no keila. They were anusim. They couldn't leave. They couldn't leave Russia. So they had to live this way. But they had such high level of tzaddikim. That's why it's uh, amazing uh, that so many gdole ado came out from there. Under all this turmoil that they had, all the problems they had. Anyway... When it comes to when it comes to uh, a mikveh, this rabbi, we go back to the original story. One is one, wanted to build a mikveh, and he had rich people, and they had the money. They just didn't want to give it for the mikveh. So the rabbi said, "Okay, I'm going to go to the richest guy. I'm gonna, and he's the cheapest one too. He likes his money more than everybody else." I tell him, "Listen, we need to raise some money for the mikveh." He goes, "No, for the rav, you know, I have problems. I have this. I have that. What what problems do you have?" Oh, you know, my wife, I, I can't stand her, I hate her, I just can't do it. Oh, I have a pitaon for you. I have a solution for you. What? Make a nedel, make a nedel, that you are going to build the mikveh. You're going to build a mikveh. And if you don't fulfill this nedel, Torah says your wife's going to die. He says, really? It's a good deal for the rab. That's a rabbi. That's a rabbi. All of a sudden, he says, I make a nether, I'm not going to build a mikveh, I'm going to build a mikveh. I'll pay for the whole thing. Because he knows, he doesn't care now. He knows he's not going to fulfill it. But now, Rabbi leaves, the guy goes back, and he's looking at his wife, and he's like, Miskina, she doesn't even realize what's coming to her. She doesn't realize that her time's up. Any day now, she's going to drop dead. She starts feeling bad for her. He says, you know what, poor lady. You know what, let me take her out. Let me take her out and have some lunch together. All of a sudden, he takes her out. So he's, he's nice to her because he's, he's saying goodbye. 
She doesn't know he's saying goodbye. He takes her out. Honey, what do you want? Oh, you know what? Why don't you have both of them? Just try whatever you like. You know, I know you for a long time. You like both of them. Why don't you have both meals? She's thinking all of a sudden, my husband became generous. Yesterday, he made me work for the meal. Today, he was buying me too. Shem Echem, what's happening to what a husband I have? So she is having fun. She doesn't know what's happening. She just thinks maybe uh, Roha Kodesh came into her husband. And he's treating her good, and day after day, day after day, a few weeks go by, he runs to the rabbi, crying hysterical. He's like, for the rabbi, please, you have to help me. He says, what? What happened? She's dead? No, no, she's alive. Oh, Baruch Hashem, so what's the problem? I need her to stay alive, for the rabbi, I love her. Why do you love her? You know, a month ago, you wanted her to die. No, no, I wanted her to die when she was, uh, I didn't like her. But now I spent so much time with her over the last month, I didn't go to work. I hung out with her. We went on vacation. Went this place, went that place. I realized I love her as much as I love her when I first married her. Okay, so what's the problem? Because she's going to die any minute. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, help me. Oh, help you. Pay for the mikveh. Pay for the mikveh. That's how you got to build the mikveh. We don't know if the story is true. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But uh, because we don't have shemot, we don't have the names. But it's definitely a fantastic story to show us that sometimes people are so cheap with their money, they rather somebody else die. They value more their money, uh, their money more than they value people's life. Anything else before I start with something else? Or the same? Anything? Okay. So, in the same in the same same direction that we're going, same direction that we're going, we see that in Parashat Shmot, we have a. The birth of anti-Semitism. You know, the birth of anti-Semitism. Until now, hatred among the Goim against us was individual-based. Esav Sonel Yaakov and some of the other Goim didn't like us, but in general, it wasn't like everyone. Here in this parasha, we see that the birth of anti-Semitism, where it becomes a nationwide movement Nazism is born anti-semitism is born it it's becomes acceptable to hate Am Israel where do we see it when Paro says let's fool them let's fool these Bnei Israel and turn them into slaves turn them into nothing how did such a thing happen? Now you can say, well, you know, like we said a few days ago in last week's Shurim, in reality, Am Yisrael became ungrateful, and uh, we start by being ungrateful. We create ungratefulness in the world, and therefore the Goim also have ungratefulness. Anything that's bad in the world started from a good place. That's a teva of the world. Anything that's bad in the world started from a good place. And once the good place turned bad, then the Goim have this new power. More so than that, there's another sin that happened to Klal Yisrael, which is that Am Yisrael decided that they wanted to move. They, they didn't just like the place they lived. They want to see what New York City looks like. They want to see what Manhattan looks like in the high rises on the 35th floor. They wanted to go to Aventura. They wanted to go to Miami Beach. They wanted to go to San Francisco, Las Vegas. Why? Say, oh, we're going to start a new, uh, a new shul here. In reality, you're not, so, you're not supposed to go to a different place to start new shuls. You have a shul here, you're not allowed to leave it. If there's Torah where you live, why are you going somewhere else? Why are you going somewhere else? But they wanted to go to the city. They wanted, oh, there's business over there, there's opportunity over there, there's this and that over there. Am Yisrael made a mistake of their life, and they started moving to different places. When they started to move to different places, they started becoming influenced. By different things. Why? Until now, the Shvatim and their children, what were they surrounded? They were surrounded by their family. They were surrounded by Bnei Torah. 
everyone learned Torah, or you finished the Shas, or you said the Bavli, or you said Yerushalmi, or the Shuchan Aruch. Everybody did something. They were Torah, everybody made Torah, made Torah, made Torah, Shabbat Shemo. But now all of a sudden, one guy goes to San Francisco. He says, what did you learn this week? Oh, I learned the stock market that goes up and down. Ooh, what? The other guy went to Las Vegas. What did you learn this week? Oh, I learned that they make more money betting on horses than they make in a stock market. A week later, he says, no, you lose everything in the horses. But until I lost, I didn't know that you, I thought you were only supposed to win. And so on and so forth. The, the San Francisco started giving San Francisco advice. The uh, Vegas gave Vegas advice. Everybody started influencing, being influenced and influencing others. Little by little, we became of the Avodazara. Little by little, we became idol worshippers. We came to Egypt 70 nefashot with Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu as the leader. Yaakov Avinu and the 12 tribes came to Egypt. We left of the Avodazara. We left idol worshippers. Not only we, it wasn't uh, that we were Tzadikim when we left. We were still on the 49th level of Tum'ah. When we got to Yam Suf, the Malach said, Hashem, I'm not splitting the sea for them. Why? Elu of the Avodah Zarah, ve Elu of the Avodah Zarah. The Egyptians are idol worshippers. The Jews are idol worshippers. I'm not splitting the sea for them. He didn't want to split the sea. He goes, why? Why? They're both idol worshippers. Meaning, Mamash, we came in, Tzadikim, we left Hashem Yerachem. We left with potential in hand, but nothing in, uh, nothing, nothing in actual reality. How? How could such a thing be? When you allow the goyim to influence you because you want to befriend them, you want to go to their Christmas party, you want to go to their New Year's Eve party, or what they call it in Israel and the rest of the European world, Sylvester, because of the original Hitler that started this holiday, so-called holiday, his name was Sylvester. And Sylvester was a very well-known anti-Semite that celebrated by killing thousands and thousands of Jews every New Year for his birthday. That was his birthday present. His birthday present was to shchit, to, to, to kill a bunch of Jews on New Year's Eve. But yet you have, God only knows how many, celebrating his birthday. It's like celebrating Hitler's birthday. Ayom yom uledet, ayom yom uledet, ayom yom uledet, le'itler. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We celebrate New Year's. Oh, the ball is dropping. What dropping? Do you know how many Jews died on this day? It should be a morning day for Am Yisrael. But why? Why do we celebrate it? Because we're ignorant. We're ignorant. We have no idea what the idea is, Bechlan. And unfortunately, many of the leaders are as ignorant as the kahal, as the tzibu. They, the rabbis celebrate it. They have announcements in almost every big shul. We're going to have a New Year's party at shul. New Year's party? What New Year's? What Shana passed? What New Year's? Oh, you mean Hitler's birthday? You're going to celebrate it in shul? Didn't you just have a uh, memorial for the Holocaust? You should have a memorial every New Year. Oh, no, no, they don't, we don't celebrate him. We celebrate the times. Modernizing. No, you're, you're, you're a fanatic. You're a fanatic. Oh, so I'm fanatic about some guy that killed millions of Jews. So you're telling me that your children and your children's children, they're going to celebrate Hitler's birthday because they're going to create some holiday for it because they have to create holidays. They have nothing else to do in their life. And you're going to say, no, no, why are you celebrating Hitler's birthday? Ah, Abba, you're fanatic. Abba, you're fanatic. Hitler, he's gone already. We're just celebrating the day. So why does it have to be today? Because that's when the parties are. Oh, you want to be chukot goim. Torah says chukot goim lo telechu. Don't go with the laws of the, uh, of, the, of the goim. What happens when people that are ignorant and have leaders that are ignorant when they get so comfortable with the goyim that they invite them into their house, they celebrate their holidays, their thanksgivings, and their new years because it's neutral holidays. It's not religious. It's a neutral holiday. It's only thanksgiving. We're thanking Hashem. 
So we're inviting all of our Goyim friends to our house so we can eat turkey the size of Guam. We're going to eat it. No. What happens? Rabotai, Karim, this is what happens. I always give you presents because Hashem gives me a nice kaparat avonot every Motzei Shabbat. And he tells me what's happening in the world. So what's happening in the world? Our dear friend, Chaim Shaulson, who is a honest Ish Emet journalist, almost like Mama, it's like Sani Moshe Rabenu in, in, in the world today. It doesn't exist, honest journalism. He actually reports with pictures. So you don't think, oh, fanatic, crazy people. Oh, no. On his blog, you can see pictures. You can see pictures on the internet. What do you see? In the world of the ultra-Orthodox, meaning Haridim, the best of the best. It happened this year in, the Great, in Great Britain, in the UK. Many Haridim, many Haridim, we're not talking about Baal Tshuva, they still don't know if they're Goim or Jews. Haridim, the best of the best. Many Haridim went to church on the Christian holiday and praised the royal family. Do I have to continue further? Well, I will. There's a picture of Haridi families, Abba with the beard, as long as our exile, the, 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 the mom with a uh, nice wig, probably at least a couple of thousand dollars, and all their little cute little children wearing Santa Claus outfits. On the way where? To church. Don't go to church. Why? We have to give a kavod la goim, the queen. First of all, you're not allowed to give any kavod to any queen, to any king of any nation. To go out of your way, if you're in a place and you, you may get death penalty, different story. But to go out of your way, to go give kavod to a queen, shemechem. Shemechem. What kavod are you giving? All this kavod people give to Donald Trump? Shemechem. What kavod are you giving to this person? Go out of your way to go and meet him. Why? Go meet the Gdorado. Go, go meet Rav Kanievsky. Go meet uh, the, 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 uh, the Stipler's son. Go meet, uh, go meet Rav Mazuz. Go meet Rav Kaminetsky in, 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 in America. Go meet some Gdolei Ado. You're going to, well, I'm going to the White House. Why? I'm going to meet Donald Trump and take pictures. I can put it on my website. For what? What's it going to do for you? Did you spend as much effort to go kiss the hand of a tzaddik? But no. We're going to give kavod to the goyim, to the queen, that she's alive 300 years already, maybe. Imaynara. Now, Rabotai, how could such a thing happen that the, the most religious among us, a few hours away, are going to church? You should know, according to Allah, you're not allowed to walk into a church. Even if somebody's chasing a Jew with a knife, one of these Arab Ishmaelim, chasing him with one of these uh, daggers that he has. From Shnot Antiochus, wants to kill him. He has to hide. Not allowed to go into a church. It's a place of Abu Dazara. Not allowed. Which means that all these Haredim, the only Haredim by clothing, not by actual knowledge. Knowledge, they would know, not allowed to go there. Even if there wasn't an Isu, even if there wasn't not allowed to go give Kavot to the Goim and their kings and so on, you still wouldn't be allowed to go to church. But they go. Why do they go? Because. The leaders in the UK are more wicked than the Pope. This Mirvis, or Mirvis, Yimach Shimov Zichro, head rabbi over there, and his partner in crime, Dwek Yimach Shimov Zichro, two so called rabbis, not only do they teach Christianity in the Jewish schools, Jewish schools, Yeshivot, they teach Christianity, they bring priests. And pastors to teach, because we need to know everything, including Abu Dazara. Now it's not enough to learn Masechet Abu Dazara. We need to learn Abu Dazara from the source. Next, they're going to bring you Yeshu Imachshimo. They're going to bring him to the class. Hey, class, here he's going to tell you what it's like to be in Gainom. Here you go, Yeshu. Here, teach them. Bring him in a seance, maybe. 
But it's not enough. That's not enough. What do they do? They're on the board of the directors of so-called Judeo-Christian organizations, which only Hashem knows how many millions and millions of dollars it's funneling and lining their pocket with to sell Am Yisrael. They're on the board of directors, leaders, leaders of organizations that their whole purpose is to create unity between the Jews and their arch enemy that has killed more Jews than any other nation in the world. We're going to become united with them. We're going to teach together. We're going to hang out together. We're going to eat together. Gemara says you're not allowed. Allah says you're not allowed. No, we're going to make a new Torah. This Rabotai, it's not only the leader's fault. It's not only Dweck's fault. It's not only Mirvi's fault. It's Klal Yisrael's fault. Why? Because Klal Yisrael, lo machu. They saw things are going wrong. They saw Rabbi Basus, Shichye, say, scream out, cry. Tell people, what kind of Rabbi you have? He's going with the Christians. He's doing things against the law. He's uh, promoting homosexuality. No, everybody says, yeah, yeah, I know, Kvod Narav, you know, it's, you gotta modernize a little bit. You gotta modernize, live with the times, make fun of it. You're fanatic. So what happens? No one, not enough at least, because I know at least one cried out. And not enough people cried out. So now it's acceptable behavior, not only to befriend them, to be on the board of, directs with, board of directors with them, to teach their Avodah Zarah in our schools, but now we're escalating a level. It's now a new minag among our brothers in the UK to go to church. To new minag. When? On the day full of Tumah. The worst day of the world. For Am Yisrael, we're going to go to church. And if you said, oh, that's only because... Uh, they're, they're, they're not Shomer Shabbat, so they don't know anything. No, no, no. This is the Haredim. This, Rabotai, is our fault. If our Torah here in America, if our Torah in Eretz Yisrael, if our Torah anywhere in the world was as pure as it's supposed to be, people in the UK wouldn't sin. People in France wouldn't sin. People in America wouldn't sin. If we educate our kids the right way, our kids won't sin. But the reality is that we live in a generation where everyone thinks that the whole world owes them something. We have this mentality of, what have you done for me lately? What have you done for me, Rabbi? What have you done for me, Abba and Ima? What have you done for me, God? As soon as God gives you a problem, you start complaining against God. Like as if you have an argument. Like you actually are allowed to complain to God. You tell no, no, listen, go, go complain to Hashem. I'll answer your prayers. Who says you have a right to complain to Hashem? Did you, say, did you at least say as much thank you to Hashem as you are complaining against Him? Do you even know what you're supposed to say thank you for? This is the problem that Yeshaya Navi Isaiah says to Am Yisrael, and unfortunately many of us have never read this. And if we read it, we forgot it. And if we didn't forget it, then I don't know what else was wrong with us. I'm trying to come up with kapsut. What does Isaiah say to us? What does Isaiah say to us? What does Isaiah? What does he say? He says, "Yada shor koneu v'chamor avuz be'alav Yisrael lo yada ami lo itbonen." He says, even the ox, the bull, knew who its owner is. The donkey, the donkey, Arab donkey, he knew who his master is. But Am Yisrael doesn't know. Am Yisrael doesn't know. My people does not comprehend. They just don't get it. They don't get it. The donkey gets it. The ox gets it. You throw a little piece of meat to a dog. The dog gets it. Why? He says, oh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Want a kiss? Want a hug? Want me to sit on your lap? Want me to uh, make some uh, nice decoration in your living room? What do you want, sir? Oh, thank you. The dog knows who the owner is. Am Yisrael doesn't know who the owner is. 
Am Yisrael doesn't know. It's not me saying. It's Isaiah saying. Almost 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, he's saying this. Apparently nothing has changed. We don't know who our owner is. We don't know anything because, unfortunately, if we knew, we wouldn't go to church. We wouldn't allow such rabbis to make such problems for our nation. But this all starts with a certain type of state of mind that's full of tum'ah. What mindset is this? Chazal says, Betin reshaim techsal. The stomach of the reshaim is always going to be empty. Why is the stomach of the reshaim always going to be empty? Because the rasha never thinks for a second about all the good he has. All he thinks about is what is he missing? In the business world, you have to take inventory. You have to take inventory. Why do you take inventory? You take inventory to, number one, see what you have. I have 20 of this, 30 of this, 50 of this, 100 of this, 3 of this. Oh, I got a refill of the one. That's three. You realize what you don't have. You realize what you have. You do the accounting. Am Yisrael Ifamim. Sometimes, when Am Yisrael does not have enough Torah, we only look at the things we're missing. We're not looking at the things that we actually have. It's an ungrateful mentality. And the Gemara says that there are certain types of people that Hashem simply hates. Hates with an H. Hates them. Who are these people? Ungrateful people. In Parashat Bechukotai, there's a very, very interesting, scary thing that Hashem says that if we don't follow His mitzvot, before He gives us the punishment, that you eat Hashem the, the meat of your children, the enemy is going to chase you, and so on and so forth, before He says all of that, he says, V'nig'alti. Nig'alti meaning, I become disgusted by you. Revolted by you. You, my children, I'm disgusted by your actions. Imagine, your wife, your beautiful wife, she gives you a nice little cute little tiny baby, tzaddik, katan, or little daughter, beautiful, has never sinned. Mama is perfect. You look at the baby, it's like, <sighs> Disgusting. Is your wife going to stay with you? You're on the next bus back to wherever you came from. Not even a car. Disgusted of my kid? What's the matter with you? No one gets disgusted of their children. Even if they do things that are disgusting. Hashem says, I become disgusted by us. Why? Because the only reason a person could ever get to a point of sinning against the Shem is because he does something disgusting. Something that's so disgusting that even his Father in Heaven is disgusted. What is it? Ungratefulness. Ungratefulness is by far the most disgusting, revolting behavior that a human being can produce. Because what is it, Bemit? What is it really ungratefulness. What's such a big deal about being ungrateful? A person needs to realize that there are certain people in history that Hashem created them not only for what they did, but also what we can learn from them. For example, we'll learn from the worst in recent history. Hitler, for anyone that knows a little bit about speaking, the, the, the whole aspect in, of speaking, will know that you don't necessarily need to understand German to know that he was a spectacular speaker. People think that Obama Osama was a spectacular speaker. Hitler puts Obama Osama to shame with his power of speech that he had. 
You don't have to understand a single word he says, but you're motivated to do something. His speaking ability was Mama Siyat Dishmaya. Help from heaven. How do I know it's help from heaven? Before Hitler came to power, he was by far the biggest loser in the world. He had never won in anything. I don't even think he won a tic-tac-toe match among his friends, if he had any. He never had a job in his life. The first paycheck that he ever got, first paycheck, was from the German government when he's the leader. Now he's an employee of the government working his way up the ladder. He never worked his way up to the ladder. He went from being the biggest loser, biggest degenerate, garbage of the world, to literally being the leader of a country that Hashem Yachem almost destroyed the world. Things like this don't happen. It almost happened again recently with Obama Osama, but Baruch Hashem, Hashem had mercy on us. The reality, the guy was the biggest loser in the world, achieved nothing, failed in school. He even tried to enlist in the army. I believe it's in, um, not uh, Germany, the other uh, Nazi nation. Holland. Uh, no, not Poland. I think it was, no, not Holland. Different country. And he tried enlisting in the army to be a general. Want to be uh, something. They said, you cannot even be a leader. They told him in the letter. This is a letter. That's a public letter. You can't even be a leader of 10 people. You're not qualified to be a leader of 10 people. Nothing. You're a loser. But what does Hashem do? He makes him a leader of a nation that nearly wiped out Am Yisrael Hashem Yerachem. This is Siyat Dishmaya. This is Hashem showing you Ani Velo Malach. It was me and not an angel. Don't blame the Yetzirah. Ani Velo Shaliach. Me and not some messenger. Me. Hashem said it. Why? It's not humanly possible for such a loser to never have a job and all of a sudden he's the CEO. Never had a job, not even as a busboy, all of a sudden they make him CEO of Google, CEO of, of UPS. Why? The guy doesn't know how, what stock is. He doesn't know what shipment is. He doesn't know cheshbon, doesn't know math. You make him CEO, well, what is he going to be CEO of what? This is what Hashem is showing us. It's me. It's not anybody else. Don't blame anything else. Clear message. The Chachamim of the time saw this clearly. They screamed. They yelled. Rav Wasserman Alava Shalom screamed about it for years. He said the Chafetz Chaim showed me almost 10 years before the Holocaust. The Chafetz Chaim is teacher. Alava Shalom says, I see rivers of blood. Rivers of blood coming. Chachamim saw this. It wasn't some big chokhmah. Oh, oh. What did everybody do? Laughed at them. They laughed at the Chafetz Chaim. People think the Chafetz Chaim was uh, viewed as something special in his day by everyone. Today he's viewed as something special by everyone. In his day he was mocked and frowned upon. Why? People are fools. They want to be goyim. He says, I see rivers of blood. No one paid attention. Ah, you fanatics. You Haredim, you fanatics. You're from ancient history. You're uh, from uh, days of uh, Egypt. It's not Egypt anymore. We're in Germany. We're sophisticated. We're in America. We're sophisticated. Well, Hashem doesn't give them a car right away. He tries to give us signs because He has mercy on His nation. He has mercy on His children because He loves us as much as He's disgusted by us from the things that we do. He has mercy on us before He gets to that point. He gave us signs. There's a sign that no one else, if this wasn't enough, there's a sign that no one else can dispute. That Hitler had disgusting midot. Character traits that were disgusting. For example, one of the laws that he passed is that we have to kill all, before the Jews, all of the Germans, all of the people that were old or disabled. 
anyone that was old can't take care of themselves anyone that's disabled paraplegic blind deaf any type of disability has no value to bring to society we have to get rid of them why he says that this is a world for young people we don't need the old people we don't need the disabled they cannot produce anything useful to society now for anyone with a little bit of heart anybody with a little bit of sechel you see clearly this person is a sick person this is a sick person that means that in reality if his own father was old he'd kill him too if his own mother that brought him to the world carried him for nine months fed him when he couldn't feed himself changed him when he couldn't change himself if she was old he'd kill her too if his own brother was missing a leg missing an eye missing an arm he'd kill him too before we got to the Jews he's killing his own people why this is the world for young people this is a Mida, a character trait that comes from ungratefulness why ungratefulness because a person that's ungrateful only looks at what chaser, what's missing what's missing an ungrateful person only looks at what's missing because he believes or she believes with a hundred percent emuna emuna shlema that the world owes her something that the world owes him something oh my parents just got me a car oh did Chadesh. what Chadesh? they're supposed to buy me a car what they bring me to the world to, to, to torture me yeah but you should say thank you to your parents well thank you they they, they have to buy it that's what I, I talk to some kids now I see these kids they don't say thank you to their parents yeah, yeah he has to buy me a car Abba I need a new car this car is garbage that's how they talk to their parents People talk to their parents like this. I wish I could tell you they're goyim. This character trait of ungratefulness is unfortunately something that Hitler has. But as we said earlier, anything that's bad started from a good place. And even though it transfers to the bad, it doesn't say that it leaves the good. This midah of ungratefulness is one of the cancers of our nation today. We simply think that the world owes us something. We think that our wives owe us something. We think that Hashem owes us something. As soon as there is some type of problem in life, we go complain to Hashem like we have a right to complain. We go complain against our wives like we have a right to complain. We go complain against our kids like we have a right to complain against our kids. We go complain about our husbands like as if we have a right to complain. Now, if they did something bad and you want to complain, before you complained, did you evaluate the good too? Did you weigh them on the scale? Okay, so she didn't cook today. But did she cook yesterday? Did she cook the day before? Did she carry your children for nine months? Would you carry her children for nine months? Did she even look at you when no one else wanted to? Did she talk to you when nobody else wanted to talk to you? Was she there for you when nobody else wanted to be? Oh, but you're going to make a big deal because she didn't cook today. What kind of wife do I have? People say to me. I see. I don't know what kind of husband does she have me skin up poor lady poor lady what kind of husband she has a husband like this people complain with no end no end but they never tell you about the mahmaot the compliments the good things why it's supposed to be what she's my wife supposed to cook supposed to clean supposed to make money supposed to be superman superwoman super everything She's supposed to be. Who said? 
Oh, the best yet is when the women complain about their husband. Oh, he doesn't provide enough. Well, does he try? Yeah, he works this, uh, this garbage job and he doesn't make enough money. Okay, but he works though. He doesn't sit home all day on the couch playing video games. Did you say thank you, honey, for going to work and doing your best to bring money so we can eat? Yeah, but I can't buy a purse. But can you eat the purse? No, you can eat the food that he provides though, right? The purse you can't eat. If he brought you a purse instead of food, you'd still die. But the food you can eat. Yeah, but he's supposed to. Why? People have this warped understanding that the world owes them something. Everybody's supposed to do stuff for them. And what ends up happening, Abu Taya Karim, is they create an unhealthy mentality which produces unhealthy children. When they're ungrateful for each other, their children will also be ungrateful to them. Because they see that Abba is ungrateful to Ima. Because every time she cooks, Abba complains that it's not good. They see that Ima is not grateful to Abba. Because as soon as he leaves, she tells the kids Lashonara about Abba. And how he's a bum. And how he's not this. And how he's not that. And so the kids, they view Abba as a bum. And a this and a that. Behind his back though. Because they're scared. So the little gremlins end up becoming a shaim. Why? Because that's the way you brought them up. You show them that ungratefulness is uh, perfectly fine. So then you come and say, listen, Rabbi, uh, my kids don't know how to say thank you. Do you? Do you know how to say thank you? No, no, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about my kids. Yes, but do you know how to say thank you? Yeah, yeah, of course I know how to say thank you. Of course, of course I know how to say thank you. Okay, let's test it. When was the last time you thanked Hashem for your eyebrows? Excuse me? When was the last time you sat there with full kavana and thanked Hashem for your eyebrows? Because you know, if you didn't have eyebrows, your sweat will burn your eyes. Oh, you didn't think about that. Oh, so that obviously means you didn't thank Hashem for your eyebrows ever. Let's... Test number two. Let's give you the benefit of that. When was the last time you thanked the Shem for your eyelashes? Your eyelashes. Little pretty eyelashes? Huh? Huh? Eyelash. When did you thank him for it? Eyelashes. You have to say yes. Thank you to a Shem for eyelashes? Well, let's see. Let's think about it. If you didn't have eyelashes, that means that any time dirt would come your way, which is at all times because we live in the world, we don't live in a bubble, all of the dirt will enter your eyes. And therefore, you wouldn't be able to see in um, no eyes after a week. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that, 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 that is something. Thank you, Hashem. Oh, now you, at 39 years old, you finally said thank you. You finally said thank you at 39 years old for eyelashes you've had for 39 years without saying thank you. Let's test more. When was the last time you thanked Hashem for your ears being here instead of being on the bottom of your foot. What if Hashem made your ears on the bottom of your foot? That every time somebody spoke to you, he's like, hey, hold on a second, and you'd raise your foot like a gymnast. Hold on, I can't hear you. It's funny, but it's not funny. Why? Because we're used to the ears being over here. We're used to the eyes being over here instead of like a horse over here. That you don't have to go like this all day. What? Can't see you, can't hear you. Hold on, let me lay my foot. We're used to it. It's supposed to be this way. Why? God created us that way. Does he owe you anything? Does he owe you the ears to be here? You know how many people have ears over here but they can't hear? You know how many people have eyes right over here but they can't see? You know how many people have legs but they still can't walk? I bet they would say thank you. When do we say thank you? When we lose. You only start appreciating your hair once you start going bald. You only start appreciating your eyes once you're old and you lose your vision. Or if it's from some type of tragedy. 
You only start appreciating your little children that make noise and break your house when one of them gets sick. Why? Throughout the whole day, you say, oh, they're driving me crazy. No, stop drawing on the walls. No, stop. Oh, you're wrecking my house. You're wrecking my life. Stop it already. But as soon as one of them gets a cold and the cold lasts for three or four days, oh, Hashem, Hashem, please, refuah shlema. Who should I call? Refuah shlema, refuah shlema. What should I learn? What should I do? All of a sudden, it became Baba Sali. Why? The kid has a cough for three days. Why? But two, three days ago, you were complaining that he's wrecking your house. You know how many people would pay their fortunes to have your kid wrecking their house? Not a kid that's a domem, just sits there, still life baby, that he can't move because he's paraplegic, can't move. All he does is wink his eyes once in a while because he wants some. No! Kid that's wrecking the house, jumping up and down, climbing the walls, breaking the chandelier. They want that kid. You know how much they would pay for it? Did you ever say thank you for that kid? Or you're too busy complaining about him? No, God gave me kids. Oh, he owes you? He owes you a kid? He owes you eyes? He owes you ears? He owes you feet? Every single part of your body that you look at, if you look at it from the right lens, you'll realize how grateful you should be to such an extent that you should never, ever, ever complain to Hashem about anything. Nothing. Something as simple as your nail on your finger, your eyelashes, your eyebrows, your nose being here, your feet, your anything. And that's just your body. Oh, wow, once we go to your bank account, the fact that you actually even have a bank account. Or maybe yet, people that complain, oh, I got home and I can't believe it. There's so much noise, so much way. Hold on a second. You have a home? You have a home? You actually have a place that you can actually go to sleep and not worry about animals and bugs and robbers just killing you in the middle of the street just because? You actually have a place with a door? And there's a bed too. Yeah, but there's noise. You know how much those people that are homeless on the street would pay, would do, to have the noise you have in your house with the bed included, even without the bed. But no, you want to complain about the bed. It's not comfortable, this bed. The house is too hot. The house is too cold. The neighbors are noisy. The neighbors are this. The faucet doesn't work. This darn bathroom. This, this. this. All we do all day is complain and complain and complain. Why? Because we are convinced that Hashem owes us something. His creation our spouse, our kids, our partners, our colleagues, our bosses, our employees, the vendors, everybody owes me something, we think. Everybody owes me something. So as soon as something happens that's against our desire, we lose our cool. Why? You owe me. You owe me. How dare you go against me when you're already in debt to me? We think all of a sudden we became China. Everybody owes us money. Even the word America. We owe everybody else money. We're in so much debt that it's really embarrassing to see a person complain. If you just simply recognize your status and where you are. But this is how the Torah teaches us. The difference between a rasha and a tzaddik is this midah, this character trait of gratefulness. The reshaim arurim want to kill everybody that owes them something, even if they really don't. Hitler wanted to kill anyone that doesn't fit his profile. Why? Because he's not contributing to his idealistic society. So therefore we should get rid of them. Because they owe me, he thought. All of the Reshaim, 
always think that the world owes them something. But what about the tzaddikim? Let's look at the tzaddikim. Yaakov Avinu cries to Hashem, and he says, Hashem, please, please, I'm in so much debt to you. Katonti mikola chasadim u mikola emet. I'm, 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 I'm nothing in comparison to all you've given me already. What did he ask him already? What did you give him so already? Oh, remember when I asked you for clothes and food? You gave it to me. I'm already in debt to you for that. That's all you asked for? Clothes and food? Isn't he supposed to give you? Why did he create you for if he's not going to give you clothes and food? Why he created me is his business. The fact that I'm in debt is my business. That's the mind of a tzaddik. That's the mind of Yaakov Avinu. He understood clearly, Hashem doesn't owe you a thing. Anyone that tells you Hashem owes you something is a kufir gamu. He doesn't owe you anything. You say, oh, so what did he create me for? That's his business. We don't ask him why he does what he does. We have our gemarot and our different chazal that says, atov mlativ, the good wants to create good, but it doesn't mean he owes you. At no point does it say he owes you anything. But even if we look at Hashem's creation and we see what little we could understand of why he did what he did, are we doing the same thing? It says that Hashem Barach is perfect. We don't doubt it. We don't question it. It's very easy to understand. All you need to do is look at the creation and you see perfection. Through the cancers, through the Holocaust, through the pogroms, through the inquisitions, the problems, the nightmares, the financial crisis, through all of it, you see an order to the world, a perfect order to the world. It's very easy to see. Only people that don't see are people that don't want to see. You see that Boreid Barach created a perfect world. And the Torah says, why did Hashem even create it if He's perfect already? If He's perfect already, why did He create? It says because Hashem has a character trait that's basically impossible for us to understand. What is it? He wants to create good. Now, if one of us wants to do something good, we're all pretty decent people. So, if somebody asked you for a favor, and it was within your means to do it, you do it. Somebody says, do me a favor. I really can't get to point B without a ride. I don't have money to use a cab. I don't have, this. I don't have any other way to do it. Do me a favor. Give me a ride. Most normal people will say, no problem. Get in. Give him a ride. Why? You need a favor. And if you can't do it, you'll take a couple of dollars out of your pocket and say, listen, I can't do it, but I'll order you a cab. And I'll pay for the cab. Because you can't do it, I want the schut to help you. Somebody says, listen, this, uh, I don't know, milk I'm buying over here. I forgot my wallet at home. You have a couple of dollars I can borrow, I'll pay you back. No problem. You don't even have to pay me back sometimes, you'll say. Why? Somebody need a favor, you can help them out. Normal people, you ask them for a favor, they do it. Most people are like this. Am Israel is like this. If you're not like this, then you should question whether you're part of Am Israel. Because this is a midah of Abraham Avinu. But that's not the good of Hashem. That's not the good of Hashem. That's the good of us. That's standard that we should do. And most of us do. Unless we're evil within, and that's a different story. The midah of Hashem of good is quite different. What is it like? I heard Arab Zamir Cohen say this recently in the uh, lecture in Israel. And I had an idea about it. I had a chidush from what he said. And it's emet. He says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he's not like us. He doesn't wait for somebody to ask, do you need a ride? He doesn't wait for somebody to ask, I need this, I need that, please help me, please that. No, no. Hashem, what is it like? Hashem goes from door to door. You need any help? You need any help? No? Okay. You need any help? Can I help you with something? Can I clean your house? 
Can I fix something? Can I bring kids here? Can I do something? Can I help you? He goes unsolicited to our homes. Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? I want to help you. Not we're helping him. We're not asking him for help. He helps us without us asking. That's a shame. That's a tov bara le'ativ. The good created in order to bring good. How can we do something that's similar to the Midah of Hashem? Most of us are not going to go after the Shi'ul and start knocking on doors because most likely we'll get arrested anyway. But how can we do something good? The Torah says, Prophet Jeremiah says, Im kar mi zolel If you bring someone precious who used to be a luggard, you will be like my mouth. If you help somebody that used to be a rasha, mechalel shabbat, bad midot, bad to his wife, bad to her husband, wearing no clothes, wearing bad clothes, and so on and so forth, you bring them and you get them to do tshuva, you'll be like my mouth. What does it mean to be like Hashem's mouth? Because if you go out of your way, and do chesed for people who didn't even ask you. You'll be like me. You go out of your way to go help Am Yisrael do tshuva and come back to Abba B'Shamayim. Yeah, but Abba didn't ask to come back. Exactly. Didn't ask to go to, uh, to, to learn Torah. Exactly. Didn't ask to do tshuva. Perfect. That way you'll be like me. Because I go door to door and I ask him, can I help you? If you go help other people and go out of your way to do Kiruv, to support Kiruv, to get Ami said to come back, you're going to be like me. But if you're too busy saying, what about me? What about me? When is it going to be my time? When is my, my bank account going to grow? When is my house going to grow? When am I going to go on vacation? You're too busy being selfish. You're too busy trying to emulate Hitler. Not Hashem. Hitler. Starts with an H. Just not the same. Not the same. Rabotai Karim, this type of mentality is killing us. The mentality that we think the world owes us something is killing us. The Gemara says something mafrid, something scary. The Gemara in Masechet Chulin, page 122a, and it's also in Nida 55a. It says something that any normal person initially will probably vomit, and then later on will start doing Chatanu, Avinu, Pashanu. I have to do Tshuva immediately, or else my kids are going to do this to me. What is it? The Gemara says, originally, originally, Torah says, the skin of a person is not tummy. Skin, somebody dies. The skin itself does not transfer tuma. Doesn't. But Chazal, the sages, say no. As soon as somebody dies, tummy, impure. Who asked you to add some law to the Torah? We say all the time, oh, you aren't supposed to say, don't add, don't subtract. People have problems with the sages, like they did something for no reason. Hashem didn't say that the body is tame. He didn't. Why did you say that the skin is tame? The Gemara says this. The skin is tame. The skin of a dead person is tame. So the children don't take their parents' skin and turn it into rugs after they die. Why? When a person only sees himself, even when his own father's dying next to him, his own mother's dying next to him, all he can think about, who's going to get the house? Who's going to get the portfolio? I'm going to get the car. I like this car. This has been my favorite car since I was this small. I want the car. The, the parents are dying. They're dead over there, but they're already thinking about, how are we going to split the assets? 
to such an extent that they're going to fight over everything, including the skin of the parents. Why? No, no, I can use the skin. It could be a rug, nice, on my walls. That's what happens. That's what happens when all we see is ourself. Our children, Hashem Yirachem Alenu, our children turn out to be vicious Hitlers. And say, skin, Abba, no, it's two different things. When he was alive, he was Abba. Now that he's dead, it's skin I can put on my walls. Unfortunately, many people do this while their parents are still alive. They go send them to old homes and don't visit them. And most of the time, these places have Rishayim Aurim working there that hit the old people and beat them up and give them medicine to try to kill them faster and put them to sleep. And many times when they did investigations on these places everywhere around the world, they did something in Israel, Hashem Echem, I saw it, I was crying the whole time. What they do, they had a hidden camera, what they do to these people. They beat them up nonstop. They give them drugs. They do all types of horrible, horrible things. But it's not the fault of the Rishayim. The Rishayim are Rishayim. Who's the fault? The children. Why'd you send your Abba, your Ima, that brought you into the world to a place without visiting them, without double-checking, without seeing what's going on, without listening to them? Oh, I was too busy. With what? With my own family. Yeah, but they brought you to the world, you Rasha. They brought you to the world. They carried you. They supported you. Yeah, but they're not the same anymore. You're not the same anymore. There's a horrible story I heard from Rabbi Fahim that will put things into perspective. It's a true story. The person that went through it himself said the story. Young guy, selfish as most people, saw his father get older and his father started living with him. As his father got older, he started shaking. He started shaking. People shake. They're, they don't have the same balance. They don't have the same memory. Kamala says that Am Aretz that gets older is very different than a Talmit Chacham that grows older. Tamit Chacham that grows older becomes sharper with time. As he got older, he got better. Psychologically, mentally, Torah-wise, physically, we all age. Ama Haaretz, person that's ignorant, don't, doesn't have Torah in his life, as he gets older, he becomes a bigger fool. All of his bad traits become worse. If he was a little bit angry, he gets really angry. If he had a filthy mouth, he has a worse mouth, and so on and so forth. Sometimes you're next to some of these older people, it's uncomfortable to be next to them because they're racist and they say certain things that you can't believe you have to stand next to this man. I saw with my own eyes. Some older man that was a family of a person that I knew, you sit next to the person, he's cursing out every nationality next to him. Oh, she's this, he's that, he's this, he's that. Shemei Hashem, you're like, I don't feel the same way, don't look at me. But you don't know what to do because this old man, he's 90 years old. But he is like the Ku Klux Klan. Surprised they didn't shoot me. He didn't have a gun on him. Point is, Abutai, this person had his father in his house, and every time he would give his father a cup of drink, the father would shake and spill everywhere. Every time he gave him food, the food would go everywhere. Eventually he got so angry at his father, he threw him out of the house. Threw him in the streets. His eight-year-old son was walking from school, and he saw his grandfather in the streets. It was night, it was freezing. And his grandfather says, please, 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 give me a jacket, get, get me a jacket, please, tell your Abba to give me a jacket, please. I'm freezing. The kid ran home, said, Abba, Abba, uh, Saba is in the street, he's cold, he, he asked if we can give him a jacket. 
and uh, Abba was still angry. He said, okay, okay, fine, fine. There's an attic. In the attic, we have some extra jackets. Go get one of them and give it to him. Fine. The kid went upstairs, took a little while, comes down, and the jacket is ripped in half. So what'd you do to the jacket, son? Oh, I cut it in half. Why'd you do that, son? Well, I wanted to give half to, to, to Saba. And the other half I'm saving for you, Abba, when you get old. The eight-year-old kid wasn't trying to be a chutzpan, wasn't trying to be rude to his Abba. He just did a kalva chomel. He said, if this is what happens to Saba when he gets old, we throw him in the streets, and when he's cold and he's freezing, and all he's going to get is a jacket, then now what's going to happen to my Abba? Oh, so let me see for my Abba already now. His father started shaking. And he went and he brought his Abba back inside. But do we need to go through such horror, such Musa from an eight-year-old? We need to learn Musa from an eight-year-old when we have the Torah Kedusha? The eight-year-old is teaching us Musa that we're supposed to give respect to the people that helped us be here to remind us to say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We have a Torah. We have a Torah, Rabotai. We have a Torah. This Torah is the greatest creation if we use it. If we don't use it, it becomes some of it. It becomes the potion of death. Because Hashem says, if you don't follow it, I'll become disgusted by you. Because your nature will be against mine. Your midot will be against your purpose. People think that they're doing Hashem a favor by doing tshuva. They think they're doing Hashem a favor by keeping Shabbat, by keeping modesty. They think they're doing Hashem a favor by learning Torah. Hashem is perfect with or without us. Nothing will change by Him. The Torah is our lifeline to be Bnei Adam, to be decent human beings. It's the only way. Why, you want to try the secular way? Go look at the most sophisticated among them. Many people like to look up to Aristotle. Aristotle, sophisticated, philosopher, wow, amazing. There's a very famous story that comes out in Ma'am Loez that his students one time walked into his house when he was eating and they saw him eat like a dog. Eat like a dog, no forks, no knives, no nothing. Eat like a dog, like a mamash, an animal. They saw food all over his body, mamash, disgusting. And he said, teacher, you're teaching us philosophy, higher class, higher this. What are you doing? He said to them, when I eat, I'm not Aristotle. Meaning, what I teach you, it's not me per se. I teach it. I teach you to do certain things. It doesn't change me and who I am. I just teach it because it sounds good in a shiul. It sounds good in a lecture. It looks good in a book. It makes a good title. It sells books. It doesn't make me, me. That's the difference with Ami Slam. If you teach Torah, you have to be that person, or at least aspire to be. Because if you don't, if you teach things without an intention of doing what you say, the Gemara says it was better off that you would have suffocated inside your mother's belly. Why? You're the biggest hypocrite in the world. You'll cause more people to go off the derech than stay on. All of these sophisticated people, they give you a source sheet in their lectures from, from, their, from their schools and this and that. How come their kila is not doing tshuva? How come people are becoming Christians? 
How come all of the next generation, you see the next generation with your own eyes? You don't have to listen to me. You go to all these modern orthodox keilot. You go to all of these half orthodox keilot. You go to all of these places that are half Hashem, sometimes maybe. And you see simply with your own eyes the next generation. You don't have to talk to anybody. Just look at the next generation. Not a single girl is modest. Not a single guy is into Torah Temet. Everyone is into how they look. Just like the queen. Everyone's just into how they look. And they fix their dress. They make sure it's fitted. And they make sure the, the pants are especially tight. So we definitely look like Nazis in the army. And it, you know, Because that's the, the Gemara of the Nazis, by the way. That's what their uniform was. The tight, tight legging pants, that's Nazi uniform for anyone who doesn't know. This, uh, what is it called? Uh, skinny jeans. Skinny jeans is from Nazi uniforms. They invented it. Ashrechem for, for, for wearing those jeans. You're helping the Nazis. Continue. Everybody fix their jacket, and then you see some guys in the uh, Nishibot. They flip the tie. Oh, what kind of tie? Oh, it's Hugo Boss. Ah, I got DK. Why? Why do you even know the names? I know because I was in that world. Why do you know? You lived in a from from birth. Why do you know the brand of the ties, Bechlal? Well, I saw an article. I Baruch Hashem didn't read it. Some rabbi said, oh, we shouldn't forgive LeBron James. That's the article of the head rabbi. We shouldn't forgive LeBron James for some tweet he made. I don't know. I guess he spoke against Jews or whatever he did. Who cares? Why do you want your keila to again look into LeBron James? Why do you know LeBron James as a rabbi? We spend so much time trying to be like the Goim, we forget that we're Jews. And we see the next generation forgets a little more. And you can't even go to a park because the most religious among us don't know how to dress. The most religious among us don't know anything in Torah. The most religious among us apparently are going to church. And of course there's going to be some haters that say, No, you're magzim, you're exaggerating. It's only a few people in the UK. That's too many. That's too many. A few people is too many. A few people is too many. A few Haridim going to church on Christmas is too many. We have a problem, Rabotai, and it starts with us. You want to bring Kedushah to the world, you start with the person you see in the mirror. You start working on yourself. You start valuing things for what they are. Stop complaining for heaven's sake. Stop complaining you're not what you want to be and you don't have what you want to have. You want something, go try and get it. Aspire to be something special. Bring something to the world, not to yourself. Do something for other people without having a single benefit out of it. Can you do it? Can you do something beneficial for other people without having an interest? Without even getting a kola kavod? Without even getting applause? Can you do something anonymously? Can you give anonymously? Can you do anything, even if they know your name, for other people? Maybe you could just start by not complaining. Maybe we can start by saying thank you more often. Next time your wife gives you anything, even if it's a hello, you should be grateful. Next time you see your kids, you should be grateful. Next time you see your husband, you should be grateful. Next time you see your closet and there's clothes there, be grateful. Yeah, but they don't fit. Be grateful you have anything. Yaakov was crying about it. Just to have clothes, you have it. Be grateful that you have enough food to be overweight, that the clothes don't fit. That means you have a lot of something else. The reality is, Abu we have so much to be grateful of. It's mamash busha vechirpa. That we have, think we have a right to complain. 
This is one of the most important things that a person needs to have, needs to develop, in order to develop a true connection with Hashem. Because if your connection is dependent on Hashem giving you stuff, then you have a problem with this, this relationship is demented. There's something wrong with this relationship. You've turned Hashem, a Boreid Barach, the creator of all, the master of all, the king of kings, into your employee. You think Hashem owes you something. We're not saying don't ask. You have to ask for everything. Even if it's fixing your daughter's toy, it broke, or you have to put it together, ask Hashem to help you, screw the screw. Ask Hashem to help you, go to the bathroom. Ask Hashem to help you, understand the daf. Ask Hashem to help you, drink the water and not choke. Ask Hashem to help you in everything. But don't complain. There's no mitzvah of complaining. There's no mitzvah of complaining, Abutai. There's no mitzvah of complaining. There's no merit whatsoever in complaining. It won't get you anything anyway. It'll make you think you're right. It'll make you think that the world owes you something. This is a problem. Because if you do it, your spouse will do it. If she does it or he does it, your kids are going to do it. And all you're doing is bringing more ungrateful people to the world. And ungratefulness is a horrible midah that produces evil. We have to learn how to be grateful. Because if we're not, we simply are not seeing the greater picture, the chesed from Hashem, the gift from Hashem that's non-stop. There's much more, but I think you get the point, Bezat Hashem. I'm going to give you a story that will give you a little bit of a perspective of the difference between someone that understands what being grateful is versus the rest of us that need to do tshuva for it. In the ghetto from Valsha, ghetto in Valsha, there were three gdole olam, three giants. One of them was Rabbi David Shapira. Another one was, was uh, Rav Shimshon Stodenheimer. And the third was Rav Menachem Zumba, Zemba. They said that in that generation, there were two Gdole Adol. They knew the entire Torah back and forth. The entire Shas, Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yerushalmi, Entire Shuchan Aruch, Rambam, Midrashim, everything. Back and forth, like the back of their hand. This was a generation of the Chafetz Chaim, and these two Gdolei Ador were Rav Godinsky and Rav Zemba. So in his ghetto, the, everyone knew that anyone that moves out of it is going to get killed. It's going to get murdered in cold blood by the evil Nazis. But the church, the Catholic church, who pretends like it helped some Jews, to this day they pretend they helped us. In reality, they didn't help anybody but themselves. But they wanted the world to think that they're nice and religious people and very friendly and very kind and very merciful so they came to the ghetto and they said, listen, we have the ability to save you three rabbis. We have the ability to save you three rabbis and your families. But you have to get everything ready with your families tonight. Because everyone else in this camp is moving tomorrow. The three tzaddikim had a meeting among them, and Rav Shapira said, I thought about it, and I'm not going to expect you to follow what I do, but I've decided that I'm going to stay. Because I don't want all of these poor people that have literally very little time to live 
that expect us to be with them, that they're going to be just a little bit happier as a result of seeing us among them. They don't have much time. And I don't want them to be even a little bit less happy because we're not next to them. So I can't leave my brothers and sisters. I'm going to be here. Yeah, but you don't know everybody in Valsha. You don't know in this ghetto. You don't know everybody. It's thousands and thousands of people. You're not friends with all of them. They're not your keila. They're my brothers and sisters. I'm not leaving. The Tucha Chamim, he said, you made a psak. We're doing the same. We're following your psak. And all three of them stayed with everybody in this ghetto. And everybody got murdered in cold blood. Except Rav Shapira, who miraculously escaped and lived to tell us the story. Now when they decided to stay in a concentration camp, in a guaranteed death for themselves and their families, they didn't do it because they're expecting some guy 70 years later to say a story and all of you are going to say, wow, kola kavod. No one will kill their family for a story. No one will kill their family for anything. But they did it for Klal Yisrael. Why? Because they knew that Klal Yisrael, they're Hashem's kids. We love them. If we cause them a little bit of less happiness in the world because they don't see that we're together, they don't see that we're among them, that we're together with them, we're going to die with them, we're going to survive with them, we're going to be there with them, they're going to have a little bit more tzal, more sorrow than what Hashem really wanted for them. It's better off we die. It's better off we stay here with them. When was the last time we did anything? Considering the sorrow of another person. Oh, if I don't call him now, he's going to feel bad. Or if I don't call her, uh, she's going to feel bad. Or if I don't go and if I don't do it, when do we think about this? Usually we only think about it when it sins. Why? Because the Yetzirah tells you, yeah, you should go to this mixed wedding, uh, mixed a dance wedding. It's a mitzvah. No, it's a mitzvah. You should go to the funeral. Funeral is good. Why? Pia Menachem. Shlomo Amelech says, go to the funeral, not to the party. But we want to go to the party. Party is more fun. Even though there's Shedim there. Utaye Karim, the tzaddikim of Am Yisrael didn't live for you to tell stories about them. They lived simply to do the will of Hashem. We tell the stories about them because we wish to hopefully emulate their behavior. Hopefully we can be a grain under their feet. But you don't say stories like this about Reshaim. You're never going to hear a story like this about some wicked person. Because wicked people don't sacrifice themselves. Wicked people don't sacrifice anything that's going to hurt them. This is why Rav Wasim and Allah Shalom, as it's reported by Rav Ephraim Asheri, in his book, Sefer Kovetz uh, Shmuim, in Perik Aleph, he writes the last speech of Rav Wasserman. Rav Wasserman had the ability, as I told you many times, the ability to escape the Holocaust. He already knew about Hitler many, many years before everybody else because the Chafetz Chaim already told him that he sees rivers of blood. He knew exactly who Hitler was and he still came back to his yeshiva because he couldn't leave his students behind. But when they were moments away from death, he gave a speech. And one of the people that survived it tells the story and he literally remembers word for word. He writes word for word of what the Rav said. And Rav Wasserman says, 
Apparently in Shamaim, they view us as tzaddikim. Apparently in Shamaim, they view us as tzaddikim because we have been selected. We have been chosen to be the korbanot, to be the sacrificial lambs for the nation. There is no time to spare. There is no time to waste. It's time for us to do tshuva. And the tshuva shlema, nonetheless, to clean our minds and not have any complaints against Hashem. To thank Hashem for giving us the opportunity to fulfill this mitzvah of sacrificing ourselves and allowing the heavenly fire to turn our bodies into something that's going to be a kapara for all of our brothers and sisters in America. Our death will help other people live. If Rav Wasim and Allah Shalom had an ounce of ego, an ounce of kavod, would he say such a thing? Would he even think that anyone's listening to him? Would he think that anyone would ever live to tell the story? The reality is, Rabotai Karim, without Torah, you cannot get to a clean, kosher mind. It's impossible. When you do tshuva, when you learn Torah, all you're doing is taking out the garbage, the filth, the disgusting, smelly evil from your mind, from your neshama, you're throwing it in the garbage and replacing it with kedusha. Beautiful, tasty kedusha. You're not doing anyone a favor other than you and the people around you. The most important thing that a person needs to know is that the way you know for sure that you're doing tshuva is if your world around you changes. Not if your bank account changes. Not if your clothes change. Not if your kippah gets bigger or bechlal exists. Not if you're wearing a kisu rosh. Or, no, that's not, that doesn't mean you're religious. That just means you change your wardrobe. The only way you're going to know if you did tshuva is if the world around you changes and the people around you change in a sense that they're behaving differently because of you. You've influenced the public to change, to improve. Your wife all of a sudden is improving. Why? She can't stay the same person when you've become so much better. Your husband is improving. Why? He can't feel right being the same Haman when you're becoming Sarai Menu. Your kids are changing. They cannot, they cannot stay little Hitlers if Abba and Ima are Avram and Sarah. They can't. Why? You influence them. Your friends change. Your, everything changes. But if your world stays the same, corrupt, upside down, you're angry at everyone, you're mad at everyone, you're this at everyone, that means, Rabotai, nothing has changed other than your clothes. It's time for us to do tshuva. It's time for us to start taking things seriously, intimately. Take it to your heart. These are the sipurim of the tzaddikim. This is what the righteous people got to. They got to seeing the point of their life, that their life was complete mesirut nefesh for everyone else. To improve the world around us. It's the only way. It's the only way. Once we start thinking like that, Be'ezrat Hashem, all of the bachot, all of the good things come true. Be'ezrat Hashem, the Mashiach will come and actually have something good to say to us. And that's we become a walking Kiddush Hashem. Any questions? We said that Rabotai, a lot to think about. I think that this is one of those shurim that should be watched a few times as a reminder on a regular basis because after you hear it once, you get a certain message. The second time, a different type of message. Third time, fourth time, fifth time, a hundred time, you get different types of message that will hit your neshama multiple times. And it's a reminder. 
It's one of those reminders that we need to have the next time you feel like complaining. The next time you feel like you have a right to complain about anything in your life. Before you start complaining and let all the garbage out of your mouth, start counting. Count your chickens. What do you have? What do you have? You have kids, you have a wife, you have hair, you have eyelashes, you have a car. You have, what do you have? What's your inventory? Look at your inventory. Count it, calculate it, and then see if you have a reason to complain. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.